the embrace, fist bumps, and handshakes, the helping hands, and warm smiles, an arm around you when you're going through trials, prayer times, and team breaks, back slaps, and being face to face, serve closer, 30 mile mission. Welcome to our worship today. Glad you're tuning in. It is Sunday, August 8th, the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, and we delight in your presence as we continue to produce these videos and at the same time gather together in worship. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the epistle lesson, Paul says, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children and follow in his ways. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive them and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sin. O Jesus, living bread from heaven, we confess to you that we are by nature sinful. We have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, actions, and inactions. We have grumbled and complained. We have been bitter, unkind, and unforgiving. We haven't imitated you at all, but have gone our own way, away from you. And yet, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we ask you to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dear friends, Almighty God sent His Son to die for us for His sake, forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of the Word made flesh, I take great delight in announcing that grace of God made manifest to all of us. Because Jesus died, we shall live. Our sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Old Testament lesson this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 4 through 8. Elijah was afraid of Queen Jezebel's threats to kill him, and he ran for his life. Going a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree and sat underneath it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than any of my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat for otherwise the journey ahead will be too much for you. So Elijah got up, ate, and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Herob, the mountain of the Lord. The epistle lesson this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 5 two. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors. For we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands. As to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths. But only what is useful for building up. As there is need. So that your words may Give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, to which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. As God in Christ has forgiven you, therefore be imitators of God, as beloved children, and live in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This ends the reading. The gospel for this, the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from John chapter 6, starting at verse 35 and picking it up later at verse 41. Jesus again elaborates, elaborates on him being the bread of life. John records, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry again, 
and those who believe in me will never thirst. The people began to murmur in disagreement because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, hey, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and his mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? Jesus replied, stop complaining about what I said. For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, they will be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I, who have seen, was sent from God, have seen him. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I offer so that the world may live, is my flesh. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Thus says the Lord through his prophet, as the snow and the rain come down from heaven and return not, but water the earth making it break forth and sprout, bringing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall accomplish that for which I have sent it and succeed in the purposes I have directed. O Lord, let this so happen today through your servant. Amen. There are few things more pleasing in life than the smell of baking bread. When we lived in Germany... On the same block as our apartment complex was the Baccarat Holst. And some mornings, when the wind was right, you'd wake up drooling. Smelled that good. The aroma, the best advertisement the place could have. Second best, a lot of free samples if you went in. In fact, some days, that was actually my breakfast. If I'd go to get bread early in the morning, I'd, I'd eat out there. <laughs> while it was still warm. Herr Holst, sitting there proud behind his counter. Artisan Brot is what he told me. And at first I thought that was all one long German word. But he meant artisan. Handmade, whole grain, crusty yet chewy, melt in your mouth bread. Racks and racks of them, of all different kinds behind the counter. I'm actually getting hungry just thinking about it. It was bread of such character. Not the mass-produced, square-bodied, chemically-preserved white bread, but loaves that were individually crafted, quality ingredients mixed and slowly fermented. I figure, though, that that kind of deliciousness is an acquired taste. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, we thought Wonder Bread was all the rage, you know, building strong bodies 12 ways. But that was when bread was the least important part of any sandwich. That was when I didn't know any better. And I think back, and I probably would not have appreciated Herr Holse's skill or his bread. My reaction would probably be same as Jesus hears when he started talking about him. A kind of a, Ugh, so what, and walk away. The whole of John chapter 6 and five weeks worth of our lectionary system is really a lesson in artisan bread. Now it starts off with his feeding the hungry masses and its comparison to manna in the wilderness and then people chasing him back and forth across the Sea of Galilee wanting more of it. But now he turns him on the heel by his shocking revelation that he, Jesus himself, is the true bread. And feeding upon him is the means of taking all that he has to offer for, for humanity to get that satisfying, full feeling of life in all its abundance, that daily nutritional influence of the Holy Spirit, that delicious foretaste of an eternal feast to come. It was a hard saying, they say, Eat me is, in effect, what Jesus is saying. He would push it even further, saying, this eat my flesh and drink my blood. So that the next week, we're going to find out that uh, many of his disciples turned away and no longer followed him. 
like artisan bread itself, Christ seemed to be an acquired taste. It's as if Jesus is actually trying to reduce his movement around them to simple, basic, wholesome ingredients until he finally turns around to those that are left and say, are you leaving me too? And Peter, speaking for the twelve, speaking for us also, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. But we're sort of getting ahead of ourselves. That's next week. Here, Jesus just says he is the bread of life, the true bread from heaven, his body, food indeed for the world. So I thought today we should combine that with Paul's challenge in the epistle lesson to be imitators of God in Christ Jesus and combine that with his oft-repeated description of what the church is. You are the body of Christ, he says. That's us. The church should embody Christ's body. The church should be like a bakery, offering itself as the bread of life. So I ask, are we, as a church, artisans made? There's a hungry world out there that's looking for something delicious, healthy, filling. We should be emitting a wondrous aroma. We should be giving out free samples. We should be an artisan church. I read up on the subject this week and found out that exact artisan bread is really exactly what the name implies. Bread that is not mass produced, but handcrafted. And it's best described and actually defined by thinking of the one who makes that bread. An artisan baker is a craftsman, giving each loaf his personal attention. It's someone trained and accomplished to mix, ferment, shape, and bake each and every one. I think that's a perfect analogy to the church. We are such bread, and Christ is our artisan. Each congregation is his personal, lovingly molded creation. As the grains of wheat are scattered in the hill and are gathered to become one loaf, we read in the Didache, that early Christian document, that's us. Many different ingredients, once scattered, but now gathered and mixed into one to give glory to God. So how are we doing? As part of my research, I came across this scoreboard for judging bread. <laughs> and you'll, you'll see it hopefully on the screen here. It's been used for centuries to grade qualities of artisan bread in contests or just for personal use. And I figured with just a little tweaking, we might apply it to the church. Whether it's Good Shepherd or wherever congregation you happen to be. Let's go through it. First category, worth 10 points, is general appearance. How does the bread look? It's shape. The roundness, the smoothness. Does it have no cracks, bumps, or bulges? How about its color? It should be somewhere between golden brown and mahogany. And yet it should bear all the marks of its individuality. So what about the church? How does our church look to visitors, passers-by? How well is our facility maintained? Are we attractive? Do we make a good impression? Can we do better? The second category, also worth 10 points, is lightness. It's hard to define as a category. We're not talking about weight or color here, but what is called the spirit of the bread. Kind of an intangible aspect, usually evident in what's not present in a particular loaf. So what about us? What kind of spirit do people experience in this place? Is there a lightness, a sense of God's uplifting presence in and among us, in our worship, our relationships, our service? Do we convey that sense of mystery, of wonder and awe of a mighty God, of forgiveness received and given? 
The third category, also worth 10 points, is crust. The thickness, quality, crispness, and tenderness of the outside of the loaf. The crust serves both as protection and a safeguard of freshness, but it's also as a contrast to the rest of the bread. And, and granted, crust is often a matter of personal taste. Some don't eat it at all. For some, it's the best part. But the standards still should be high. So we need to ask ourselves, <laughs> what are our crunchy parts that some might want to throw away or not work through? Are there barriers that need to be softened for someone to feel welcome and embraced here? The next category, crumb. <laughs> it's only worth five points, and, and by crumb I mean the singular, not the plural. It's not all the things that get scattered, so much of its content, a technical term for the loaf's internal structure. For this, you kind of analyze the flour, the yeast amounts, the hydration, which is the size of the bubbles in a loaf, how it's mixed and fashioned. In most loaves, when cut open, you should see a definitive, discernible swirl. So let's ask ourselves, do we stick together, mesh in a visible way, or do we crumble apart? How obvious are the Holy Spirit's swirls in our makeup as a congregation? The next category, texture, is, is really important. That's why it's worth 25 points. A good texture is a result of having a good crumb. <laughs> that there are no streaks or clumps, that the loaf should have elasticity and softness and springiness. So what about us? Are we a tender church, flexible enough to respond to needs as they arise? Do we exhibit the, the blending of diverse peoples in a harmonious way? Do people, do we give up and, and you know, like give way and spring back to the touch of God for other people to see. Of course, flavor is the most important part. As with bread, though, flavor involves not just the taste, but also the aroma, the smell. Before one can know if a loaf is palatable or delicious or anything in between, it should be enticing. So what about us? Are people attracted by our aroma in worship and fellowship? How nourishing are we? How healthy? Are we good for people? Do people want to come back for more? Do they tell others so that they can do so? The last category is pretty minor. It's only worth five points, but it's called the keeping qualities. And this is a rather odd category because Artisan bread, by its very nature of its ingredients, should have a short shelf life. No more than two days maximum. Meaning it's meant to be enjoyed right away, not saved for later. So turning the focus on us. Are we made fresh daily or are we in danger of growing stale? Do we exhibit that manna kind of faith I spoke about last week? each day given enough by God sufficient for that day? How well do we embody Christ, who says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and yet also, behold, I make all things new? So that's the scorecard. So that's okay. Tally it up. How did we do? But before you confirm the results, a warning. Or maybe it's just really a reminder that this really isn't an exercise of, of how good or bad or needy Good Shepherd Lutheran Church might be or whatever church you're speaking about because we're not going to collect the results and they would be too subjective and, and might even be counterproductive. No, the artisan church, like the body of Christ, is determined often by its ingredients. So to finish Paul's statement, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You can't grade the artisan church without actually grading yourself. How can you be a better ingredient for Christ's 
handcrafted masterpiece. What do you need to do to get a better score? You know, the, the Baccarat Holtz is, is a pretty fond memory. And I've had some good breads ever since then. It's, it, there, there's been some. And when I bounced this idea of what this sermon was going to be like with some people, I got unsolicited a whole bunch of suggestions where to find really good bread. Some said Panera. Another said that there's a whole bunch of Grand Central bakeries around that has some really good breads. Someone said Ken's Blonde Vatard in Northwest Portland is to die for. Others, you could not pass up a croissant from Le Provence. <laughs> for me, though, I, I think uh, I rate highest uh, my wife's own communion bread <laughs> and uh, Sally Galligan's beer bread. But the thing is, we all have these suggestions. They're the word of mouth advertising that we're also, each and every one of us, the free samples of Christ's artisan creation. That's how others will know where to find the bread from heaven. So, by our aroma, by the blending of our ingredients, by the imprint of our master, might we be an artisan church. God grant that. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Let us lift up our hearts in prayer to God who knows what we need even before we ask. We pray. O oh, living bread from heaven, nourish your church with the supper of the Lord and give it boldness to invite people to your table that they might be fed and nourished. You gave your son to be bread of, for the life of the world. Watch over the fields of the earth so that food might be harvested in our days. So many places seem to be ravaged by drought or inundated by floods. Be with those who despair over bad weather and enable harvest to be good. O oh, bread of life, you satisfy our every hunger. Be with all who are in need and draw near to the sick and the suffering that they might be made well, especially those we lift up with concern in our hearts right now. We give you thanks for those who minister to help those infected with COVID. Give strength and hope to, to all nurses, doctors, caregivers, therapists, that they might be drawn to you, that they might see your blessing in their work. Oh God, you call us to imitate you as your beloved children. Help us to do so. Bless the fruits of our congregation's ministries. Enable us to be the aroma of Christ that many might be drawn to you, yearning to be fed. Be with those who mourn, that they may find comfort in the promise of the everlasting life. Give us the words and the ways to help them find strength and consolation. And bring us at length, all of us, to your banquet table where with the company of the saints we will dine with you for all eternity. Hear us as we pray, living God. And in your mercy, give us all good things for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. That's our worship for today.
couple of announcements. Well, thank you for watching. <laughs> a couple of announcements. We do have next week a congregational meeting to discuss the possibility of allowing this outside group to use our facilities to start a brand new preschool. Um, they'll be meeting with us today, but if you have a curiosity, feel free and we'll answer every question that we can possibly be able to answer. 30 Mile Mission is coming up, and, um, <laughs> and, and for that time, uh, that's August 22nd, we will be having only one service at 11 o'clock. Um, and a reminder that we're having this great block party for the neighborhood around us that's all brand new houses that we're going to provide food and give them an opportunity to know each other and to be really good neighbors. LWML has a meeting on Thursday of this week. If you want to be a part of that, call the office to get any details with regard to that. Um, everything else is, is summer days and, and we're, 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 we're plugging along and, and finding different ways to show God's love to other people wherever you're at. May you be safe and secure. May you find ways to, to share love to those that you know and be that aroma of Christ to God for everywhere you meet. God bless you.